that again? I'm sorry. Uh, so going. rare is great. Well done is bad. Just like if you're ordering. Day. Well, then we'll hear about how all that happened. So thanks, Jim, for speaking with us. And sure. uh, John's going to set up the recording. Take it it's away. Gone. Recording. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, John. Thanks you all for giving me an opportunity to ramble on for a few minutes about just the assorted bullshit that uh, I call life these days, uh, which is pretty exciting some days. Um, most of you know me, you've seen me hang out. I've been, you know, coming to Chow since day one and have, you know, haven't exactly fallen off the map, but I haven't really been that present for the last few weeks. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to hang out with you guys. Um, Let's see, quick little background. Uh, let me see, I'm a Scorpio, long watch it walks on beaches. I like to shave down and then up, usual stuff, things you're used to. Um, Air Force brat, so bounced around a lot as a kid. You know, it seemed like, shit, before I was seven, I had lived in uh, three countries and, you know, four different places. Um, yeah. Um, so ended up in Alaska when I was 12. And I think one of the advantages and disadvantages of bouncing around a lot as a kid, uh, the advantages are I learned how to present well to people because it's sort of like you have a minimal amount of time to make friends and to form contacts and stuff like that. So I learned very young how to be a good showman or whatever, you know, to try and be that that person in, you know, that, that person in the room that, you know, I could connect with people quickly. The drawback is I tended to connect with people superficially because, you know, it wasn't going to be that long before I was out of there. You know, um, my girlfriend and I went to, uh, went to her place recently and, you know, and she's telling me about going to school in this place, showing me places where, you know, she, she, you know, got to make out for the first time, which I loved, uh, showing me, you know, just history of being in one place for a long time, you know, and I think that's one thing that I missed out on uh, by moving around so much. So the pros and cons, I can come into a room and I can talk to just about anybody, but I can also come into a room and not be that comfortable with anybody. Um, you know, so it's how do you grow? from that place. Um, you know, so when, you know, when I was a kid, we moved, we moved to Alaska when I was 12 and that was about when I really started going off the rails in regards to the whole family situation. So I started getting high quite a bit, you know, I think, you know, some of my first experiences with drugs were, you know, smoking a little weed, uh, sneaking scotch out of the old man's liquor cabinet. Um, like I OD'd for the first time at 11 and, uh, a phenobarbital. Um, I, I think I ate like 11 phenobarbital. I might've been 12, somewhere thereabouts, uh, drank what I consider to be a lot of vodka. And I don't remember how much that was. It could have been half a screwdriver. I don't fucking remember, but I do remember ODing and very possibly almost dying. Um, one of the, you know, and, and the way my parents handled this, um, uh, which was, pretty apropos for my childhood was to leave me in my room for two days and um, just let me go through it. So I don't, you know, I mean, I don't know if I was, well, I obviously didn't die. The possibility was there because I was just a little kid and I was on a lot of drugs, but my parents, rather than embarrass themselves by taking the, uh, the Colonel's kid to the hospital because he OD from drugs was to leave him in the room, you know, uh, Lord knows what, what they would have done had I actually died. I don't know. There probably was a dumpster in downtown Omaha somewhere that would have, no, I'm kidding. You know, I don't know about that, but that was my experience with how my parents handled crises with their children. Um, I, shortly after that, we moved to Alaska. Um, we moved there when I was like 12 to this little podunk air force base, which was in a place called Kenai. <clears throat> Kenai was this little redneck fishing community, you know, and we're talking 1970. Um, I pretty much had long hair, pretty much have had long hair my whole life, except for that nice stint in the 80s when my hair was really cool. Um, and, 
you know, so I'm this little hippie kid in Alaska uh, in this redneck community. So I fit in nowhere with the community. Um, we lived on an Air Force base, which was a little ways out of town. And the only people I fit in with there were the kids that I got stoned with. Um, not finding satisfaction in the home unit, I started running away from home at like 14. And by the time I was 15, I pretty much had managed to move completely out of the house and, you know, trying to figure out how to live on my own. Um, a lot of, a lot of drugs, you know, uh, uh, I garnered a healthy cocaine addiction and then it became a very unhealthy cocaine addiction. Um, you know, we, we talk about drugs a lot in a negative context. Uh, at the time for me, drugs probably saved my life because I didn't know how to deal with, uh, I didn't really understand how to deal with family, society, you know, anything um, kind of became a bit, well, I tend to react to things in one of two ways. I either fight or I, I run. And, you know, in this situation, I didn't have anything I could fight against. So I ran away from home and uh, pretty much grew up through that. Um, after years of trials and tribulations and adventures and misadventures, I ended up getting sober at 24 and got, got clean, um, in Alaska. And it's not like my relationship with my parents was completely severed at that point, but I was not living with them. However, they did introduce me to a treatment center when I was 23. Um, and that's when I first, you know, found my, my first 12 step programs and, uh, you know, hung with that for eight months. I relapsed once, uh, you know, and almost lost my life during that relapse. Uh, when I got clean at 24, I'd stayed clean for the duration um, from then on and have gone to thousands of meetings and attended, you know, a number of conventions and, you know, that sort of thing. So um, got a job. I Quick backtrack, I started in the hospitality industry when I was like 15. I started working in hotels, uh, storeroom clerk, became a desk clerk, became a bellman, and ultimately worked my way up to being a bartender. My first bartender job, I was 17. You're supposed to be 18, but this was at a hunting lodge or a, a lodge out on this lake. And, you know, at that point, they just needed somebody that could breathe and act like they knew how to open a beer. And that was me. So on my 17th birthday, I started my first bartending job and continue with that for the next, you know, until I got sober. Basically, it was pretty difficult for me to uh, attend bar and not want to shoot up all the cocaine in the world. So I, I didn't do that. And I got into working in television. And ultimately, that is what brought me to Colorado uh, was 30 when I moved to Colorado. Um, I'd been working in this TV station for uh, going on five years and just, you know, I, I, at that point I was an operating engineer. And these are the guys that basically switch between programs when you're watching them. So when you see somebody fuck up and play the same commercial three times in a row, that would be the operating engineer's job. And, you know, that would be someone like me fucking up and playing three commercials in a row. Um, you know, but during that time, I'd learned what it was like to be clean, you know, and I started doing what it took to be clean, which was, you know, first off, not using drugs. You know, I mean, that's a simple yet oftentimes overlooked <laughs> uh, necessity for not not getting high and not succumbing to addiction. Um, there's a lot of 12 step nerds here. And so I, I'm sorry if I'm just repeating shit that you already know. Uh, yeah, no, I know, John, uh, or Bill, I'm sorry. I'm going to continue to talk to both of you guys like you're just new. Um, Perfect. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I learned how to get through short periods of time without getting high. Then I learned how to get through longer periods of time without thinking about getting high. And then I realized just, you know, how lucky or blessed or guided or whatever I was because there were times to when I really wanted to get high. And I couldn't find any drugs, you know. Um, and there were times to when, you know, I, I drove limos for a while as one of my part-time jobs. I had probably seven, you know. And one time my ex-dealer hired the, you know, a limo, and I turned out to be his driver for like the next 30 hours. And over the course of that 30 hours, you know, he delivered drugs. We went to, you know, we went to hotels. He had hookers and and all this, you know, and in the hotels with the bath 
the uh, heart shaped bathtub and and I was cool. I did not want to get high through that whole time. As a matter of fact, it repulsed me, you know, that whole time. A week later, if I could have found them, you know, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today because I, you know, I didn't, I wanted to try and get high. So that was something I learned just how taken care of I was in regards to recovery. And later on in life, I learned just how taken care of I was in regards to life. So um, moved to moved to Colorado when I was 30 to go to school and I got a job repossessing cars. And for the next 18 years, I was a professional car thief, which was adventurous. It was fun. You know, I, I started shooting dope when I was 14. I don't know if that affected how my body and my brain uh, uptake serotonin or dopamine, but um, it's pretty easy to get bored. It's pretty tough to get bored when you're stealing cars. So that, you know, that fit that need very, very well. Uh, and so I am, I, you know, basically, am I an adrenaline junkie? I don't know. I like driving fast. I've had some adventurous times jumping out of airplanes and bungee diving and, uh, you know, things along those lines, but, you know, to be able to do that for a living, I know it was weird how my tolerance built, you know, cause in order by the end of my repo career, you know, the first time I repoed a car, I had the key to it, you know, or one of the first times I had the key to it you know, got in it, you know, it's three o'clock in the morning. And I think it was a Jeep Cherokee or something like that. We had keys. I got into it and I was doing like 90 miles an hour through the suburban neighborhood, trying to get out of there in time. You know, my heart was in my mouth. You know, it was, it was a very exciting time. Um, towards the end of my career, you know, some 18 years later and roughly 12,000 cars later, in order for it to be exciting, I had to like be hot wiring the car underneath people's bedroom window while they're watching Monk or something, and then try and, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, you know, for it to be, or, or, or you know, try and steal the car while they're taking groceries from the car into the house. I, I needed that extra rush, you know, to make it be exciting anymore. <clears throat> um, I, you know, 15 years ago, I had decided, you know, I started feeling like I pushed my luck about as far as I could push it. I'd seen guns maybe six times in my repo career, you know, and, and, and at the times it was very exciting, you know, I mean, uh, I, you know, my, my, uh, my nerve level rose up to here when somebody's pointing a gun at me and, and my rebellious nature kind of really came out at the, at that time. Um, and fortunately, nobody ever shot me, even when I was saying, fuck you, I'm taking the car. Uh, nobody ever shot me. And then 10 minutes later, when the, you know, that adventure had resolved itself, and I'm tasting my balls in the back of my throat, and I'm realizing just what the hell did I just do? Uh, I, you know, I started realizing that I might need to do something else for a living. And... Uh, you know, a, a buddy of mine up in Alaska when I was on vacation one summer uh, was Anchorage's hot dog guy. He and I used to work together in restaurants, you know, 25 years before, and he recommended I buy a hot dog cart and go do this. So I thought it was one of those what the fuck moments, you know, I'm 48 years old. You know, what else am I going to do? Uh, you know, so I quit my job, bought a hot dog cart and started slinging wieners on a street corner. And my friends are shaking their heads. You know, that's the most ridiculous thing, anything a middle-aged man could possibly do. You know, my, my, you know, my ex, my wife at the time is crying, you know, um, everything's going to fall apart. And it was the most exciting thing I could do. Way more exciting than stealing cars. You know, I'm standing out on a street corner and my first day, you know, I think I sold maybe 30 hot dogs, you know, and and I'm right across the street. At that time, I was right across the street from Denver's best, or according to Westward, best hot dog in Denver. Um, and, you know, and that guy, you know, so I get there early. I set up, you know, I'm there at like eight. You know, I set up. This guy rolls in at about 11.15. By 11.30, he's got a line, you know. I mean, he rolls in with his hot dog cart hot. It's already hot. I mean, there's dogs just rolling around on the grill practically. He gets there, starts selling hot dogs. About an hour and a half later, the line goes away. He starts packing up. 
and I walk over and I introduce myself, say, hi, my name's Jim. I just started today across the street. And he goes, yeah, I've been a little too busy to pay any attention to you. And and this this English wasn't this guy's first language. So, um, you know, it was said with an accent that meant something, <laughs> sort of. And I'm like, oh, well, that was nice, but accurate. <laughs> he was pretty busy. You know, I said, well, congratulations, uh, you know, on your business. I hope to do well also. Um, and I'll be across the street. And he goes, oh, we'll see. And I'm like, oh, you dick. Yes, we will see. Um, and once again, blessed, taken care of, lucky, however you want to call it. Within uh, three weeks, the, uh, the food critic for the Westward, I don't know if any of you remember Jason Sheehan, uh, Jason came by the cart, you know, and he's the most nondescript person you'd, you, you would not, you wouldn't know him from anybody, you know, I mean, he's medium height, kind of dusty looking. The only defining factor was his teeth were not good, smoked a lot, you know, whether it was meth or cigarettes or whatever. Um, nondescript guy, and I'm talking to him, and I'm just chatting people up. These are some of the skills I learned is moving from, you know, city to city and state to state when I was a kid, and I'm chatting them up. And, you know, ask him if he's working today. And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the food critic for the Westward, uh, you know, and some people told me to come down and check you out. And I'm like, yes, let's talk, you know, and uh, sampled him up with a number of hot dogs. And, you know, he really dug the thing. And so a week later, he wrote a nice piece uh, to which I was able to walk across the street to the guy and go, hey, you like the Westward as he's showing off his best of Westward placard. So there's a nice piece in the Westward this week. You know, um, he didn't really comment on that one very much. Um, and a couple of weeks later, this was right at 17th in Arapaho. A couple of weeks later, the space at 16th opened up. And so I took that spot. So I was on the 16th Street Mall, like about my fourth week in business. And, uh, you know, and, and I walked over him my last day and I said, well, I've got good news and bad news for you. I said, the, the bad news is I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm moving to another place and, and he's going, Oh, well, perhaps you will have better luck wherever you go. And I said, well, the good news is you'll be able to see me. I'm just a block right there. You know? Um, so I too can be a dick when, uh, when necessary, that's for sure. No argument in this house. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, I moved down there. anyway. Uh, I, I'd like to speed this story up a little bit. Um, I continue to get lucky and I continued to work very hard and uh, ended up getting some notoriety, um, lucky enough to get mentions in, you know, some local magazines, uh, Food and Wine wrote just a little teeny blurb about my hot dog cart, um, you know, my first year out, and, you know, and got lucky enough to get in Maxim Magazine, you know, just because I'm doing these weird-ass hot dogs. Um, so people kept asking me when I was going to franchise, and... It didn't make any sense for two reasons. One, I had no idea what the fuck they were really talking about. And two, um, I, I didn't make sense to try and franchise from a hot dog cart. I thought I would need a restaurant to be able to do that. You know, something that I had systems in place, something that you could come and check on people, make sure they're following those systems. Oh, oh, wait. Um, the first time I knew my business had changed was when somebody said, uh, you know, I heard them talking and they said, yeah, we're going to go get some biker gyms instead of saying, we're going to go get some hot dogs from biker gyms. When they said, we're going to go get some biker gyms at that point, I knew I was a brand and that just tripped me out. That was a game changer for me. Um, so moving ahead, uh, a couple of years later, you know, I managed to get my shit together enough to open a restaurant. It was, I scraped together enough money to go with the uh, uh, city of Denver had these economic development loans. I got one of those. The landlord coughed up so much tenant improvement money. So I was able to open up my first restaurant in uh, 2011. And uh, no idea what we're doing, but I put together a crew of pirates that, you know, also had no idea. We didn't know what we couldn't do. And so we had no money. Um, we were able to, I think I had maybe eight grand in the bank when I opened the doors and we were able to keep it going by hook or by crook. And I think I learned at that point that, you know, I, it was, it was reinforcing the fact that I was 
that I was being taken care of again. Um, here's a quick story, and this has it's a recovery story. Some of you may have heard it, some of you may have not. But my sobriety birthday was on Labor Day, and I managed to make it. And that was the same weekend that they would have the NA World Convention. So I'd managed to get to a number of conventions to celebrate birthdays. Um, and I was in one in uh, Chicago. It was, no, I'm sorry, uh, St. Louis. And it was my 10th anniversary. And I had this dream while I was at the convention that um, I really wanted to get high. And I'm there with this friend of mine who I've known for now going on 30 years. And currently he's got about seven years of sobriety. But at this time, you know, he was still using. And I had a dream that he and I were at this convention and we were trying to get high. And we went everywhere we went, you know, we would score some dope, but I couldn't find any work. So I couldn't fix it. So I didn't use it. Um, or we would get some dope and he'd use it before I had a chance. You know, I mean, it was just circumstance after circumstance that I could not get high in this dream. And I walked into this room and boom, it was a surprise anniversary party for me. And I'm just breaking down entirely because, you know, I'm like, well, I don't deserve this. I've spent this whole dream trying to get high. Don't you guys don't understand. And this guy said, well, did you get high? And I said, well, no, I didn't. And he goes, it works, doesn't it? You know? And those of you that know what those words mean, know what that, those words mean. So um, I have basically, you know, I, I have many examples on how I've been taken care of and blessed throughout this and not the least of which is is within my business you know so um we've been we've been popular we've been successful we've made money we haven't made money um you know for some reason i have managed to get a lot of press you know it was two years ago i think cnn named biker gyms the most famous restaurant in colorado which is really odd this oddball hot dog restaurant can uh, can be named you know the most famous restaurant in a place. And yet I'm not particularly adept at turning these kinds of kudos into money. So, you know, quite a bit of it has been by, you know, once again, we're, we're making money, we're keeping the doors open, but sometimes we breathe on fumes. And then last year when the pandemic hit, we were really heavily on those fumes. You know, 2018 wasn't great. 2019 was worse. And then 2020 was like, where we go into what we, we collect all our chestnuts in spring, summer, and fall and eat them all winter as winter isn't the best hot dog season. You know? And we start making money come spring. And the first event that we start making money at is the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And last year, uh, they shut everything down two days before the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And so we're fucking broke and there's no... You know, um, they're, they're, the opportunities became fewer and fewer. You know, um, we, our to-go business wasn't great. So we, we basically shut the place down and um, got right to the point to where, <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't know what we were going to do, um, except I was optimistic. Um, well, I sometimes coin the phrase uh, depressive optimist. Because, you know, I mean, I don't always feel good about shit. Some of you, many of you have seen me, uh, you know, puddle up over the, the simplest little things here on this site. Um, but, you know, days before, <laughs> you know, days before the landlords were, were ready to evict and, and all that, you know, our PPP money came through. So, bam, relief. Um, and then let, you know, and, and we managed to keep it together. You know, the crew's been truncated. Um, you know, we got, again, we got right to the point to where uh, we were, uh, right to the point to where I was, you know, <laughs> the, out of money, you know, there was like five grand in the bank again. Um, I'd, had a, I'd had a capital partner that I had tried to buy out a year ago. And, you know, I was ready to take out a big SBA loan, buy this guy out. He didn't want it. It wasn't enough. Um, in November, um, I had been talking to him about doing a bridge loan to try and get us through the rest of the year, you know, um, get us through till spring. And he's uh, pretty positive until he wasn't. And then he just said, you know what, I'm out. I'm going to sell you back all my shares in the business for a dollar. And 
I was like, thank you. Where do I sign? You know, and did that and which was amazing. I made, I made a good bit of cash that day, yet there was $3,000 in the bank and no real prospects. Um, so not knowing what to do, I just woke up every day and put one foot in front of the other. You know, we showed up for work. We, we, uh, we opened up and tried to try to sell hot dogs. Um, and then four days later, the SBA loan that I applied for in April came through. Uh, so boom, all of a sudden that financial burden wasn't alleviated, but it was lifted, you know, and I knew we'd be able to make it through until spring. Um, you know, we, we, we shut down everything, you know, we tightened the belt, um, you know, we worked out deals with the landlords. We, we paid off all the, all the vendors that we could, um, and just put one foot in front of the other. Um, and during that time I had, uh, you know, I had, uh, come together with a friend of mine that I've known for, for about 10 years. You know, we, we did food truck stuff together back when we'd first opened the restaurant. We'd done a number of pilot programs. You know, he had managed to put a business together a couple of years ago that has become quite successful. And on uh, December 31st, we aligned businesses together. And so all of a sudden I go from, you know, knowing that I can make it till spring, you know, and not being sure what's going to happen then to uh, working with a company now that has the resources and the drive to make biker gym successful. And so I got my first paycheck Friday. I haven't had a paycheck, you know, quite a while. Thanks. Um, this weekend, um, uh, my girlfriend and I are flying out to, uh, LA and we're doing a virtual Super Bowl party with a number of NFL people. We're, we're putting together biker gym packages. So the retail part of biker gyms is going to expand quite a bit. And that's one thing that my, my friend is very adept at. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in the works, really exciting stuff that, you know, has, you know, I'd always wanted to do. So currently, you know, once again, that blessed part of my life has come through. Um, and what do I do for this show up most of the time? I, uh, I don't always put my best foot forward, but I try. Um, I'm lucky that I've got friends and family. Well, my friends are my family. Okay. If you start crying, GG, I'm gonna lose it. Hey, we turn that on on here. Hmm. Can we hear? Yeah. What? I want to hear. Oh, you can't hear? Oh, everybody's muted. It's just me. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, thanks. Um, so yes, uh, life is back on track in a way that I hadn't imagined that it could be. Um, you know. Uh, Times are exciting. I've got, there's nothing, some of you guys have opened restaurants. Some of you guys have closed restaurants. You know, there's few things more exciting than opening a restaurant and few things more devastating than closing <laughs> restaurants, you know? And I imagine, I, I had the opportunity to, I've opened three restaurants and closed two of them within you know six months of each other. And that was devastating and relieving. Um, Hmm. How can I describe that? Uh, my mom died from Alzheimer's probably 12 years ago, 13 years ago. And she had, when she died, it was like being able to exhale after holding your breath for 10 years. That's like closing a restaurant, you know? You don't want to see it happen, but when it does, it's like relief, um, loss and relief. So um, being able to be in a position of excitement right now, you know, is, is phenomenal. Um, and, you know, yeah, thank you. Um, it has a lot to do with, a lot to do with Chow, really, that's helped us get through, um, that's helped us get through, you know, first off, Bourdain's passing. That was kind of what, 
you know, amazing what, I hate to say perfect timing, but, you know, um, appropriate timing or, you know, to, to start Chow at, at that point, you know, has brought a lot of close people together. Um, the fact that, you know, you can be in recovery, not in recovery, just be in hospitality or just be fucking human. And have this avenue, you know, this forum to speak and be spoke and be heard. You know? um, so I would really like to shut up um, right about now um, and listen to what some of you guys have to say, because, um, you know, my story, you know, it's, it's your story. It's everybody's story. So let's hear what you, you know, questions, 